had an opportunity to lift your name on high. We've had an opportunity to celebrate you in song and in praise and in prayer. And so, God, we ask you to allow your Holy Spirit, the parody that comes to proclaim what thus says the Lord, hide your servant behind the cross and allow the Holy Ghost to come. Open up our ears so that we can hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us this day. And help us, dear God, not only to be hearers of your new word, but your divine will. Follow after it. And we'll be faithful, God, to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You have heard the word of the Lord as recorded in the Gospel according to St. Luke. And for a few moments, beloved in Christ, we want to focus in on the sermon title, Empowered for Service. Recognizing that this is the season in which we celebrate our Christian education and our Christian education endeavors that lead us and guide us and direct us, we all need to be what? Empowered for service. Specifically in chapter 2 of Luke's Gospel, we're going to focus primarily on that 45th verse. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was, that after three days, they did not find him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. Beloved in Christ, if I mention these geographical locations, I'm wondering if you could tell me what do they have in common? Florida, Washington, D.C., California, Georgia, Mississippi, Missouri, Portugal, Illinois, New York, Michigan, and even Greece. What is it that they all have in common? The common thread is they have missing people. They have missing children. We have several missing children in our area today. <coughs> Excuse me, you, you've heard about that Sarah, Pablo, and Jacob, the brother and sister that are missing. And many of you have heard about the UVA student since September 13th, Hannah E. Graham from Charlottesville, Virginia, been missing. She was viewed on various cameras at one o'clock in the morning. But she is missing. What about that little girl who was uh, abducted or given to a man who supposedly was a character? Release her room. She's still missing. There used to be a time when at 10 o'clock, no matter what television station you looked at, there was a, a, a advertisement that came up. I see some people are smiling because they, they know. It, it, it was something that reminded us of our responsibility. Can you help me with that? Where is your children tonight? At 10 o'clock at night, where, where are your children? Where are they? Are they home, tucked in the bed? Beloved of Christ, back in the day, when the scriptures were read, there wasn't something as the Amber Alert system, where people would be able to see who was missing. But all across the world today, there are children that are missing. Did you know that? with the Maryland Missing Persons website, that there are over 53 persons that's missing here 
in the state of Maryland? You're probably wondering, okay, Pastor, where are you going with this? How is this relevant to the word of God? Well, in this biblical text, Jesus, the Son of God, had been missing for what? Three days. Three days. Now, the word of God doesn't tell us if it was three days into the journey that he had been missing, or if it was one day, part of the journey, then they got to the location and realized he wasn't there, and then they turned back, and then when they got back to the temple, it was the third day. The word doesn't go into that biblical text, but it does tell us that it was customary every three years that they would come to the temple. The men would be in one corner, the women would be in another corner, and, and then they would be conversing. The men would be talking about the word of God, and the women, of course, they'd be talking about the things that women talk about. And, and then they would all leave together, and, and it was customary that some child may be taken by some other family member or extended family member. That, a grandparent or something of that nature, they would be taken. And so it was not common for Mary and Joseph to leave and Jesus not be right in their eyesight. But on the third day, when, when, he, when, when he didn't come home that night, when, when they couldn't find him amongst the fellow sisters and brothers, ah, that's when they turned back and they went back to the temple. And notice here in the word of God, they said they found him. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. There's some people who are missing who haven't been found. They found him. Some, some child, some daughter, some son, they found him in the temple. And the word of God says he was sitting amongst the teachers. And he was both listening and asking them questions. Ah, notice, notice, notice in the word of God. It says, and they heard him, and they were astonished. Ah, beloved in Christ, we learn from this biblical text the theme, the focus of what our Christian education department is helping us to do. The first thing we can learn from this biblical text is that Jesus Christ was engaging. Notice, he's sitting there. He had to been engaging for three old days, sitting in the temple, and you know when they go in, they wouldn't come out. It's, it's not like us, you know, one hour, two hours, three, you, you gotta be crazy. You expect us to be up in church three hours? Please. For three old days? Straight? Ain't no way. Some of us would be uh, locked in. Anyway, the word of God says that he was engaging. He was challenging. He was articulate. He occupied their attention. He was winning and inviting them to understand the scriptures. And as they looked at the word of God, they were be able to understand and be revealed some things that they never knew. As they looked at the word of God, it, they, he, he gave them this brilliance of understanding. And at the age He articulated these things of knowledge that they as older men had no knowledge of. He would have been looked upon as a genius here, although he wasn't carrying himself in that way. Nor was he somewhat of a, you know, precautious kid or when he tried to put down the elders. He waxed the scriptures. He spoke with a court. And it caused them to be enlightened and engaging. Rather than at the age of 12, living a life of sin, because his life was life of holiness, it caused them to be engulfed as he studied the scripture and illuminated what the Father had taught him or had revealed to him. Ah, beloved in Christ, not too long ago, we too celebrated several young men who had the audacity to engage us, enlighten us, and occupy us 
with their attention and their knowledge. Logan, David Lane, Christopher Lawson, and Michael Johnson, all of them were engaging during our vacation Bible school and helped us to know that it's important that we understand God's work, that we hit God's work in our heart so that we would not sin against them, but that we would have also a way of understanding and understanding the urgency of the hour and knowing what God would have us to do. Jesus was first engaging and secondly, as we look closely at this text, he was educated, educated. Notice his parents likewise were not amazed. In verse number 48, it says, So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. They were amazed at the fact that Jesus had been teaching and learning and helping the others to understand God's purpose and understanding their, their purpose of existence. Their parents, as frantic as they were, had to set aside that amazement. <coughs> Excuse me. And after they set aside that amazement, his mother began to share with him, what, you know, Jesus, why? You don't have us so anxious. Can you imagine your daughter? Then you come home. 10 minutes after that curfew hour. 15 minutes after that curfew hour. 30 minutes after that curfew hour. Didn't come home that night at all. Can you imagine the worry the mother would have experienced for the father? How about this only child? This only child. And the word of God says they were furious at Jesus. Why would you put us through this anxiety? Some of us put our parents through unnecessary anxiety to them. We all have a parent to respond to. But here, as Jesus is listening to his mother share with him her concern, Jesus responds, Why do you seek me? Did you not know I must be about my father's business? You see, Jesus responds to them while they are furious. Now you know. Some of us mothers back in the day, there was no law like they have today about picking up a phone and calling the police. You, you just reached for that phone. You wouldn't have that hand. Our parents, they would tell you to go get a switch, and if you didn't bring one that was large enough, they would make sure they had, and my mother, she would grab anything that was close to hand. So if it wasn't a switch, it was, come on,
existed here was limited, but for only that period of time, he had to be about his father's business, always helping the others to understand and be educated by the things that they need to do. Oh, beloved in Christ, have you come to an understanding that you only have a minute, only 60 seconds in it, then you choose it, then make it, but it's up to you to use it. Do you understand? That God has called you and created you for something, something great that only you can do. Jesus, just, first he introduces the concept of God who is always present. And he says, I'm a father. He takes ownership. My father has sent me to do great things. He refers to God in the personal sense. And if we were biblical scholars, we would know that in the Old Testament, there are only 14 times, only 14 times where God is referred to as father. But in the New Testament, when Jesus comes onto the scene, it is always when he refers to God. It is from a personal perspective. There are many texts where it talks about Jesus acknowledging that he is of the Son of the Almighty God. And notice, 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 in the Word of God, he says, I must, I must be about my Father's business. He understood, beloved in Christ, no matter what was going on in the world, he must be about his Father's business. It's also recorded in Luke chapter 4. He says, I must preach the word of God in season and out of season. In John chapter 3, and he says, the Son of Man must be lifted up. And Jesus also moved on to completion of his understanding and all that he was supposed to do. He spoke with authority because he understood he must complete this task that God has given to him. And the word of God says, no matter how much he teach, Mary and Joseph, they didn't hear it. They didn't understand. They didn't understand the urgency of the hour. And some of us don't understand the urgency of the hour. Some of us don't understand the importance of having Jesus in our lives. That's why he's missing. Jesus is missing in some of our lives. Jesus is nowhere to be found. Jesus hasn't been found in a rock in a hard place. He couldn't be found because we haven't had that intimate relationship with him. And yet Jesus took the time to share with his mother what he must be about today, beloved of Christ. Do you truly understand the urgency of the hour? Do you recognize the signs of the time that Jesus is coming back? Will he be able to acknowledge you and can you acknowledge him in, in, in all that you do? And thirdly and most importantly, the elevation that takes place is in the text. It's in the text. Verse number 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in the favor of God and men. Luke takes it authority to, to summarize the rest of Jesus' life from 18 to 13, 33. And he talks about how Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. It talks about how he increased, and the word increase means when translated, he advanced. He advanced to the next level. He didn't stay as a child or a babe in a swaddling clothes, but he advanced to understanding and maturity and spiritual maturity of what he was supposed to do. Jesus grew, not only physically, but he grew spiritually in understanding God's purpose in his life. And not only did he grow spiritually, but he helped others that were truly interested. Everybody's not interested. Everybody's not interested in growing spiritually. Some people are just complacent. And they're happy where they are. And that's why they're waxed about what they do. They're not truly interested in growing in a spiritual way. They're, they may be interested in fulfilling their desires of their flesh, but they're not interested in growing spiritually. And as you take the inventory over your life, as we have come to the end of the month of September, can you see where you have grown spiritually? Since the beginning of this year, what areas in your life has God delivered you from? What areas in your life have you been able to grow? What areas in your life has God been able to strengthen you? What areas in your life has God been able to touch your faith and lean on you? What areas in your life can you find and you testify how God has grown you? Here, 
It says that Jesus grew. And ultimately, beloved of Christ, God desires for all of us to grow. First, to advance intellectually. He increased in wisdom. Notice in the word of God, if you remember Solomon, Solomon had an opportunity to be before God, and Solomon was able to ask God, what is it that you, God, what, what do you desire of me? And, God, and Solomon said that I ask that you would grant me wisdom above all men so that I could lead your people. What wisdom have you asked for this year? So that you will not find yourself in the same place, doing the same thing, the same old way, finding the same heartbreak. What wisdom have you asked for this year? Jesus also advanced physically in stature. Here, the word of God suggests that it was both maturity but physical growth. Here, he grew in understanding that when I was a child, I speak as a child. in the favor of God, and also in the favor of men. Don't you remember when Jesus became to his fullness? It was when he was with John, and they baptized, and God opened up the heavens of earth and heavens, and he said, this is my beloved son, and whom I am well pleased. If God were to open the heavens and earth at this very moment, would he say that this is my daughter? Or this is my son, for whom I'm well pleased. He advanced. And ultimately, God desires each of us to advance. And we have got to be empowered for service as Christian educators. We got to understand the importance of engaging everyone that we see, every person that we see, no matter how wealthy they may be or how poor they may be. We got to be able to engage and tell them of the good news. Tell them about the one that delivered you from whatever situation he delivered. Are you engaging and inviting? Are you willing to educate those in the goodness of the grace and mercy of God? And are you willing to be educated and elevated to another level? Today, beloved in Christ, God does desire us, like Jesus, to be empowered for service for him. Can we be a witness? Can we share the good word? Can we help someone understand? If so, today is the day. Today is the day that we can elevate someone else who may be lost in this world. Today is the day that we can help them understand that there is a better way. Today is the day that we can show them by our love. So let us pray. <coughs> Gracious and the most eternal God, we thank you for your word that reminds us that we need to be empowered for your service. Empowered for your service. Help us to be engaged and willing to share your good news with those who are lost. Help us, dear God, to be educated and help them to know you in the parting of their sin so that you will ultimately elevate them to their understanding of what it means to serve you in spirit and in truth and to serve you until you would come back again. We pray that this word is gone forth and will not come back void. There may be someone here today that can identify that there was a point in their life where they're right now that they are lost, but they want to be found by you, and they want to surrender themselves to you. We ask that God as the doors of the church open, and they will come. Surrender their minds, their bodies, and spirits, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our invitation hymns don't know we are Christians by our love. And as we stand on our feet, the doors of the church are open.
Blood of Christ as we prepare to end our worship experience. We hope that someone here today truly understands the importance, the significance of that biblical text. Oftentimes, we find that many people who experience life but truly don't understand God's purpose in their life. And so they just live, buying time, wasting time. And one day, God decides no longer, no longer will they exist. It's only what you do you're born and the name you're in that will determine your destiny. Will it be heaven or will it be hell? If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, won't you just give God some praise today? A very important brief meeting immediately following our worship experience. Our reception on him is amazing. Let's give our Christian education department a round of applause. So they know what they do. As we stand for the recessional, recessional hymn, 